For those of you that don't know, I'm VR evangelist Cymatic Bruce. Uh, I've done a lot of stuff from the very beginning of this whole Rift thing. Um, also, community and developer relations at Altspace VR, uh, which you'll be hearing about sometime in the future. And uh, among other things, you know, SPVR Expo and all this stuff with my main man Carl. Uh, we have been working so hard and uh, so happy to see a full packed house standing room only. This is crazy. Um, so, uh, to that effect, since we had a full house plus 140 wait list, um, we are going to change the system a little bit uh, because we have a lot of people RSVPing that are not showing and a lot of people on the waiting list that do show up. Um, so I believe what we're going to be doing in the very near future uh, is that we're going to have the $5 uh, payment um, for attendance uh, is going to be uh, through Meetup, through the website, instead of on-site. Um, so we can get people a little more uh, incentive to actually show up and uh, get some better numbers that way. Uh, because we, you know, we want to kind of avoid that whole rigmarole uh, when we try to find out who can come in through the, through the door at, the, at 6.30. Uh, so is everyone cool with that? Yeah. Yeah. Sound all right? All right. Excellent. We don't want to rustle any jimmies here. Okay. So, um, very good. Uh, so we have a few presentations for you here. The normal thing that happens at these meetups is that we have a few talks about uh, maybe 10 to 15 minutes each or less. Uh, and then after those talks, we get all the chairs out of here, transform the room, and we're going to have some demos that will be popping off. Uh, we have Temple of Merc, the closest you're going to get to VR Gauntlet. It's sick. Uh, we have Saddlefish, which I'm not sure what it is, but I'm excited. Uh, Double Me is over there. Um, we have Three Gear in the house, uh, which is going to be very cool. Uh, we have uh, some uh, community setups here, including mine. We have some Elite Dangerous, and uh, I'm going to be playing some Vanguard V over there as well. Um, and then World Viz will be up in the front. Dodo Case is here, uh, so there'll be plenty of demos to partake after the talks are done. So prepare yourself. All right, without further ado, let's get started with our speakers. We're going to start off with Dodo Case with uh, founders Craig Dalton and Patrick Buckley. Craig? Yep. All right, awesome. Um, and Dodo Case is this uh, Google Cardboard VR kit. Google Cardboard is very exciting stuff, you know, getting that mobile VR on. So I'm excited to hear what they're talking about. Let's welcome Dodo Case to the stage. Um, thanks. Oops, sorry. thanks so much for having me. Can everybody hear me all right in the back? Is this good? Yeah, cool. So uh, just quick show of hands. How many people have heard of the Google Cardboard? How many people have tried, <laughs> tried one of them out? How many have built them themselves? Like four people built one. Okay, cool. <laughs> so um, so here, it, here it is. If you haven't uh, gotten your hands on it, one, we'll pass a couple out. You can pop your phone in and give it a try. Um, I don't think I have to explain what it is. You guys pretty much know that. Um, I'm just really here to kind of, I guess, give an update on where, where we are, the kind of response we've seen. We started uh, selling a com kind of complete kit uh, within hours of Google announcing the project for I.O. Um, kind of made it really easy for everybody to get, you know, the components all in one place so they didn't have to go out and kind of scrounge them and, you know, go through the headache of that. And we're shipping um, our orders. We gave everybody four to six week kind of promise, so we just started shipping them today, actually. So we're, we're pretty pretty happy Ooh. with that. Yeah. Wait, did anybody order one from us in the room? Two? How much is it? Cool. Uh, they are $25 with an NFC tag and then $20 without an NFC tag. Assembly required, but it takes about two to five minutes, depending on how proficient you are with uh, peeling, peeling tape is really the time, time, time most timely thing. So uh, we've sold about 15,000 of these, uh, which is pretty astounding, uh, if, you, if you ask me. Uh, we expect to sell 100,000 in the next three months, and my personal goal is to sell a million of them by January 1st. Um, <laughs> And those are pretty bold numbers, but I've said them publicly now, so you can hold me accountable to that. Um, I think you've got a real opportunity for this to be kind of the most accessible um, entry point for virtual reality available. I mean, someone can literally put this thing together for you know 20 bucks. They're experiencing virtual reality for the first time 
It's not an Oculus Rift. It's not whatever Samsung's going to do. It's not going to be a hardcore gamer thing, but I think it is the way that the first million people and the mass market get introduced to virtual reality. You can think of this thing like the Model T Ford of this category. You know, the, the Oculus is like a Lamborghini, but right now people just need to get around in an affordable fit and an affordable car, right? Um, so what we really would love to see and what we'd love to help enable is um, anyone who's developing content, because there is a shortage of content for this mobile VR experience, um, we'd love to help whoever is doing that. And um, if you're working on projects that you think could work well in this type of experience, and what we think is like, this is a, like a one to five minute type of like taste, right? You've got a single button click, um, you can look around. It's actually simplifying down a lot of the user interaction challenges for VR, which I think is actually great because it simplifies it to the point where you can make something relatively quickly, get it out there, see how people respond to it, and it's intuitive for people to use. So, you know, I can put this, I was at a family reunion just uh, like two weekends ago. My, gr my grandmother was there, she's 95 years old, and she tried this out and she was like amazed. And it wasn't like she had to strap it on her head, she just picked it up and looked at it and then started telling me about what it was like when radio came out and then television came out. So that was a pretty cool conversation to have. <laughs> um, uh, but actually she really did get me thinking about kind of those other technology and media transitions. And I started doing a little research and it's kind of really interesting patterns emerged. When radio first came out, it took 38 years for it to reach 50 million users. The 1920s, they didn't even know really what the business model was for radio when it first came out. You know, they were sending basically, the business model was let's send, send mail wirelessly really fast and charge people for that. Right? So it kind of like mimicked what came before it. And then they figured out, oh, well, actually, like, we can make way more money if we just broadcast music and news and give everybody this utility that they can put in their house. And that sort of happened around 1920. And um, an interesting analogy to this, to this kind of do-it-yourself kit, the U.S. Commerce Department released these DIY build-your-own radio instructions, uh, of which kind of the main, one of the main ingredients was an oatmeal cardboard box. You know, you wrap coil around it, and that was like basically your tuner. And so in the early 1920s, a lot of people built those because they couldn't afford to buy a commercial radio, which was really expensive, like 200 bucks back then, which is like thousands of dollars in today's dollars. And so the early 1920s, the early days of radio, was very analogous to what you have right here, right? Um, so 38 years for that to reach 50 million, TV 14 years to reach 50 million, started in 1939 by the same guy who had, was instrumental in starting NBC first as a radio thing and then as a television thing. And then the internet in 1991 took four years. So each one happened three times faster than the previous one, which if you extrapolate that and you say, all right, virtual reality, this is the thing that's going to kind of trigger the commercialization and the business like for the first time and really enable it. People's smartphones are good enough. They can put it in a super low cost thing and give it a try. If this happens three times faster than the internet, that means you'll have 50 million people using virtual reality stuff by the end of 2015. Right? That's astounding, right? 50 million people potentially using virtual reality by the end of 2015. It's like, that blows your mind. How would that even happen? It's like 17 months from now. So think about how fast that's gonna happen, right? Um, so I think really there is this enormous opportunity. Right now, your mobile phone can be turned into um, not the best virtual reality experience in the world, but an amazing one for most people, maybe not for you guys, because you know what the best is, but for every lay person that I've put this in the hands of, they're like, whoa, that's amazing. This is like unbelievable, right? And I think uh, the talents of people like you guys in this room here, like you could probably crank out some apps for this type of experience 
relatively easily, or maybe even take what you already have and convert it over, and you're going to be like in a totally green field where there's almost nothing. Um, so I would really encourage you to think about it. Don't just pass it off as like a novelty thing. It's priced like as a novelty gift, which is actually part of the Trojan horse of this whole thing, right? Like you don't have to get, you don't have to convince someone to part with $300, $400. You just have to be like, hey, this is fun, try it. it costs 20 bucks. Like what's the risk? One hour of entertainment value, right? Um, so it's kind of like gonna be, uh, it's priced to be novelty. And that's on purpose. Um, but it isn't novelty. This is like how the mass, the mass market is going to experience virtual reality. And you guys are going to have a great opportunity like right now to take advantage of it. Um, so again, we've got a developer program, dev at dodocase.com. Um, we want to basically aggregate and curate the best VR apps and content into one place. So if people first try this out, they have good stuff to play with. And those two things are kind of really, you need, you need these devices and you need great content. And so we want to help whoever's trying to do that. Like, we'd love to talk with you, support you however we can, um, get you headsets, you know, feature you in our app store, whatever it is that we can do. Tell us what we can do if we don't know what to do. There's also some other interesting technology convergence stuff happening. WebGL is, was announced in the fall, to, or was announced in the spring by Apple to be supported in iOS 8. And I don't know if any of you have tried the Chrome Experiments website. Yeah, if you haven't, try it out on that. Go to, uh, I think it's g.co slash Chrome Experiments or something like that. It's amazing. It's a total awesome VR experience running in a browser. vr.chromeexperiments.com. Two E's in the middle, don't mess that up. Um, you can like build a web app that is a compelling virtual reality experience. And it's gonna work on all the major mobile platforms like when Apple announces whatever they're announcing in, in September. So this is like all just happening right now and I think it's super exciting. Um, are you doing anything or? I think you're doing good. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm ha like questions is the next one. Oh yeah, and if you, so come talk to any of us. This is Craig. Gene is back uh, in the back row, the guy with the hat with his hand up. Uh, so any of us you can talk to, ask us questions. But how does your product differ from the Google side, the refusal of PD that's been around for like nine months now and has its own set of apps and SDK out on Android? Yeah, so all those apps um, work from our experience work on this. Okay. Um, so it's a couple of things that I think, and I said I'd work, I'd talk about user interaction stuff. So one of the limiting things about this uh, cardboard design is this magnetic switch. Um, it's really clever. It's freaking awesome, but it like works on five phones, right? So you, we basically are, are trying to figure out how to solve that before we get to the holidays so that you've got a, a, a click, an effective click that will work universally across smartphones. and. It's not going to be anything sexy. It's basically going to be a conductive touch point on your screen, right? You imagine just translating this button into something that uh, flips something into a, like a stylus tip onto your screen. But there, then you've got a headset that works across all these devices with a user interaction modality that's, a, that's basically mirrors what you have on your computer today, which is a mouse click, right? So, Kind of the experience, a lot, a lot of the user interaction stuff actually just transfers over really well. Right? Your movement of your mouse translates to you looking at something, uh, and the click of your mouse just translates into one, a one-click thing. So, but how does it differ from the door that's priced at 50 euros? You know, like, what, how does it differ? Yeah, how, what, what can you offer the consumer that the door is? Yeah, well, I mean, a Daroga side is 50 euros, or actually, I think it's more, it's like 60 or 70 euros, it's like almost 100 bucks, and this costs 20 bucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Since your Dodo case, how can you make that possible? Well, so what? good question. Actually, we've been considering like a higher end uh, version, and uh, we will, I think, eventually do that, but I don't think there's, I don't think there's a, market for that yet. I think you've got to have enough of, like, of people trying this to say like, oh man, like, 
this is my introduction. I like I, this is cool. I want something better, but they're not gonna. I I I, don't, I, th I think it's hard to convince someone to spend a hundred dollars right now on something like this. But I don't think it will be for you know next year. I think it will be possible. Yes. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, you know, that's like a handheld device. Um, so my question is, like, you're talking about this kind of being the Trojan horse is the novelty part of it, but how does it break out of novelty if you always have to hold it here? And then how long is that going to happen? Is there going to be like, I mean, the kind of the, the head strap situation or a way to keep it on that's kind of nice, because then you can really get into experience for maybe 10, 20, 40 minutes or something like that. Um, yeah. So I see that as, you see that as kind of like a challenge point or something maybe from a design consideration or making something to be like help to your eyes and pass around a friend or something like what do you? Yeah, so I, I think that not having a strap is actually a feature. It makes it more approachable. Um, and it makes the kind of expectation of what the experience is like um, a much lower bar for people. And you've got your hands on something that's a natural place to put user interaction stuff. Right? You can think three-dimensional gesturing, like I want to grab something, I pinch my two fingers together. Like I've actually already got my hand in kind of a three-dimensional shape. So when you would you know, pinch equivalent on a 2D screen, you, get, you can start kind of playing with gestures around the viewer. So actually holding it works to your advantage. And again, like I think simplifying first and getting like universal support for a simple user interaction modality will help VR like get to the next step. Like, but there's gotta be a universal thing. It's like the PC before there was an agreed upon like keyboard and mouse, you know? It's so kind of everyone's feeling around for all these different things. I got my leap, I got my, you know, joint sensor thing, I got my game pad. It's like there's not the basic one though that everybody agrees on, like at the very minimum, like the very minimal, like this is what a user action should be. Yeah. Um, what about like uh, these phones interacting with each other? I think it'll be pretty easy to connect them, like so people can play socially in VR. Yeah, it's. I think there's. I think that's a super cool idea. I mean, it, it. That's. I think one of the challenges with this is it's very like introverted experience. Like someone's holding this and they're going like, "Wow, amazing!" Like, what are you? Uh, hey, what are you looking at? You know? <laughs> or like, I'm struggling. I don't get it. Like. You're like, well, which screen are you in? You know, I can't give them advice because it's hard to see. So I think that, that there's like a big opportunity around that to kind of view video in a, like a social setting. Because that's what people are used to, right? Like we all like to sit around and watch something together. Maybe it's me skiing down the mountain or the wedding or whatever. It's a social experience. And this is not like, it's not naturally a social experience, but I think it's solvable with software. Right. Yeah. Sure. So how how is that right in China? Uh, this kind of piece is about three or four dollars. Right. So it's me. It's a little bit expensive. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, if you want to go to China and have one made for three dollars, I'm not stopping you. Um, I think the realities of what you need to do to get a product into the mainstream um, retail channels in the U.S. You have to make it for one tenth of the cost of what it's.